I go to VCU once a month for this drug trial. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the, neuro the neurologist there has a Huntington's clinic that I'm also enrolled in. So, but, but like the second or third time I went to VCU for treatment, it's on the eighth floor of the main hospital building. Mm -hmm. And I got lost trying to get back out to the, like the front door where the, you know, where Emily was with the car. Mm -hmm. I ended up somehow getting into the emergency room like wandering around, they're like running traumas on people and I'm like, I'm not supposed to be in here. And anyway, I feel like that's more acceptable though, because that's something that I would do. Sure. And I don't even have anything. Right. But I just thought, you know, and so, but yeah, so, but the nurses are very nice and you know, they, they're happy to just walk me out, it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that there's actually a more direct route where I, because what I thought I had to do was walk from here all the way like over to here and take an elevator down and then go around. And it turns <laughs> out I can just go over here, take the right. elevator. I understand. But, yeah, but anyway, I just thought it was funny because I was like standing in the emergency room. And there's a, like, you know, all these people in gurneys yelling and I'm like, I should not be here. <laughs> How did I get here? Reminds me of Dexter at the funeral. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? One other thing I, I just wanted to ask about was, um, so when your father, uh, yeah, so at some point your father stopped working? Well, my father was already retired ah. when he was diagnosed. He did an early retirement, which also was probably part of the Huntington's, because looking back, he he really tried to even his job, he worked in one huge building with nobody else around. So he really had that severe anxiety about being around other people, which was part of the, the mental changes that took place years ahead. So he worked, had worked everything out so that he could take an early retirement when his company was bought out. So by the time he was diagnosed, he was already I mean, it, it was so obvious for anybody who knows Huntington's. I mean, for people that have never seen it, they don't know. So that that wasn't really an issue. But what was an issue was the driving. Yep. So before he was diagnosed, my dad used to have a motorcycle back in the day. Not like a Harley motorcycle, more like I'm a geek and let me wear this full body like kind of motorcycle <laughs> with the little raincoats and anyway. but. He was so um, fiscally conservative. That's why he had the motorcycle, so he could drive the motorcycle to work. Um, but he decided before he was diagnosed, and we knew there were some serious like um, physical function functionality issues going on. And my mom was out of town, and my dad decided he wanted a motorcycle. And he called and he decided he was going to buy this motorcycle. And I was like, shit, I'm going to do. And I'm like, you know what? If something happens, he, he wrecks this motorcycle on the way home. At least he died happy. Let's go get the motorcycle. Thank God my mom was out of town. <laughs> so I took him to get this motorcycle in Rocky Mount. And I followed him home. And I almost had a heart attack about 15 times on the way home because I did not think we were going to make it. He was all over the road. I mean, just, I was like, if we can get the motorcycle home, then I'll let my mom handle it and he can never drive it again. But at least he got it home and was able to drive it. Mm -hmm. That was a miracle. So when he was diagnosed a few months later, and the first thing that they said was, there's no way he can drive it anymore. I was like, Let's see how we're going to work this out. But he, I told him, I'm like, I'll take you wherever you need to go and be fine. So he, he was okay with that. He didn't, he wasn't one to leave the house much anyway, unless it was for church. So that wasn't as big a deal as it could have been, but it was definitely a blow to, um, you don't realize the, the freedom that you have, right. you know, when you have a license and you can drive. So that part of it was challenging for him, but like I said, he didn't really want to go anywhere anyway. I don't drive at night now because mm -hmm. I get you know confused and I don't always know what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. But I still drive in the daytime, which is very important to me. 
Right, yes. I can imagine. <coughs> At I, night, sometimes if you tilt your head to the left and like just cover one eye, it helps. But that may just be because I'm drunk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to try that. But. But. No, don't try that. God, please don't. Emily will kill me. Yeah, so, but. He'd be like, Mari said it would be fine. <laughs> Take out half the sidewalk. Yeah. No, please don't do it. But, yeah, so now, you know, I'm in, we have two, you know, boys that are 10 and 14, so mm -hmm. I still get to run, run everybody around to mm -hmm. meetings and practices and stuff, which is good. Yeah, but yeah. I, well, you should be fine for a while but, still, I think. But, but I also recognize that, yeah, you know, there's going to come a time when I, you know, but I was a little worried at first that, you know, like, <clears throat> you know, there were some, some people who were worried that just having the diagnosis meant that I was dangerous because driving knowing that I have this disease is like driving blindfolded. But I don't necessarily buy that analysis. I, I think that's a ridiculous analysis. Yes. Actually. You do. I mean really. It's um now I will say as my father really progressed, <laughs> I was driving him to church one time. And I'm like just driving along and we're on this back country road and all of a sudden he goes whop and like <laughs> hits me and we drive off the road and I come back on and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, it's okay, Dad, it's just a Huntington's moment. We're good. <laughs> and I just keep driving. But um I mean I was driving, not him, so I don't know if I would call that dangerous. That's funny though. But I mean, what are you gonna do? It was it's I don't think that the dangerous part of it like I, I don't get that like there was a time we had um we have a big family <laughs> and so everybody was there for Christmas Eve and we were opening presents and my mom had a glass coffee table also before he was diagnosed get rid of the coffee tables that are glass just actually get rid of coffee tables but um he if you can imagine 30 people in one place and wrapping paper everywhere and kids running around like crazy, the overstimulation was insane, even for somebody like me who's ADD. So I can only imagine what it was like for my dad. Um, so he, he was trying to get up off the couch, which was also a very plush, cushiony couch. You might want to rethink those as well. Yes. You want to get a couch that's nice and Firm. And yes, a firm couch that's easy to get off of. So he was trying to get up, and as he was getting up, he kicked the coffee table, and the coffee table shattered. And for somebody that didn't know what was going on, it may have looked like he was mad or whatever and got up and just, you know what I mean? <clears throat> but it wasn't. He was just having a hard time getting up, was overstimulated, and was trying to get out of that room. situation. So I think the dangerous label happens when people misunderstand what's really going on. Because I don't think, you know, I've been to the conferences and we, there was a, a support group at the Neurological Carillion that we went to a few times and we, our family actually had a Huntington's walk several years in a row here. And um, anybody that I'd ever met that that was diagnosed with Huntington's or aware of it, it wasn't a dangerous situation. There was never a dangerous situation. It was more of a misunderstanding and then an overreaction and then the person with Huntington's is reacting to the overreaction and right. just this ridiculous domino effect. So I think that education and empathy probably will take you a long way away from dangerous. Yes, that's good. Just FYI. Of course, I could be wrong, but probably not. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some research that, you know, some people with Huntington's do develop schizophrenia and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like you, right. were, you, you were saying that you're, you had the, what the my great uncle about, right. and was diagnosed with that. But now it turns out that they think that it may just be that people with Huntington's who would have probably gotten schizophrenia. The research shows they're the ones who, who get it. It's not that everybody, anyway, so. Right, yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. But, um, yeah, it's interesting how, 
Well, the other theory that I heard is that as the neurons, as the myelin coating dies off the neurons and those nerve cells can't propagate the impulse, is this too technical? <laughs> um, that it will manifest in a similar way that right. you know schizophrenia might in some people. Yeah. So there's that too. Yes. But yeah. So I know some people who say, I haven't yet, but you know. And I, I guess it depends. If it was like yellow submarine type hallucinations, right. that'd be okay with you know, fish and birds and stuff. Right. Well, my dad went through. He never hallucinated, but he had persistent negative thoughts. So, for instance, he, he might think that something was going on and he, he couldn't get that out of his head. Like, he couldn't let it go. You know, like his thinking that his dog had been hit by a car when his dog hadn't been hit by a car and he just couldn't let it go and, and he stuff like that would happen so I wouldn't call that a hallucination but it, to him it was very very that fear was very real yes yeah, so well that's good to know mm -hmm. I mean it's good to be aware of what I meant but it also helped like once my my dad could kindly finally voice to me what he was thinking because at first he was he was really reluctant to tell people because he didn't want anybody to think he was going crazy. But once he was able to voice what he was thinking, that helped too. So just that um, being understood, I guess. Let's see. Now you and your sisters tested negative. Yes, that's right. We did. We did test negative. And um, in fact, we found out that my dad had Huntington's not too long after they had isolated the gene. So we had to go up to John Hopkins oh. in Maryland. Is it Maryland? Yep. And we had to go through like three months of genetic counseling and like all kinds of stuff before they would agree to test us. And so my youngest sister went first because she was like, I'm not getting married and I'm not having kids and I'm not doing this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, my middle sister and I were like, well, it's kind of too late for us to be thinking about that, isn't it? <laughs> I see. So I went up several times, and the, the when they called me and told me that my test results were ready and that I could come up, we had it, it was, my oldest son was 13. And we planned it to where, my sister lives in Northern Virginia, and I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. There's a Marilyn Manson and corn concert. <laughs> So for our, my son's 13th birthday, I'm going to take him to see Marilyn Manson and Corn. And we had tickets, so I, that's why everybody thought I was going up there. So we went to that show, and then before the show that day, I like ran up to John Hopkins and got my test results and found out I was negative and came back and then took the kids to the show. And mom, when I called my mom and told her that I was negative, she just completely went to pieces. I can't believe that you would go up there and not tell me you were going. You didn't tell anybody what was going on. And I'm like, well, I didn't want people to, you know, worry. She's like, well, what would you have done if you were positive? And I'm like, I'd have gone to the show. Just like if I was, <laughs> like, I'm not, what am I going to change? Like, there's nothing I can do about it. But, um, so, yeah. I don't know if they still do that at John Hopkins. But that was a great resource. They have a great program. And my sister went several years later. She made us wait. Middle sister, they do that, you know. But she also tested negative, so we really beat the odds. That's good. Yeah. So, can I ask about what, one more topic? Go ahead. So how did, because you told me, you know, that, yes, that, that Julian and Thorin, Thorian were very much involved in taking care of their Absolutely. grandpa. Absolutely, yes. Um, because one of the things that came up with us was, you know, I felt like it was really important that Alex and Teddy, you know, know immediately. Absolutely. Because they're going to be living in the house with me absolutely. and I'm going to forget things and wander around and shake. Right. Absolutely. And so we, uh, actually there's this really great genetic counselor in town who helped us sit, sit down and talk to them and explain it, you know, in a very sort of non-freaky mm -hmm. way. <clears throat> yes. And that was... Um, a point of contention with a few members of my family. They really were concerned about the boys, especially Dorian being so much younger, because Julian was 13 
when I found out I was negative, which meant Dorian was like five or six maybe. Um, and I really got some flack from other members of the family because they were concerned about them being around my dad and have, not that they were worried about anything happening to them, but they're like, well, do you really want them to see your dad in this condition? And, and I was like, it's, it's their grandfather, of course. Like, that's your family. Right. Like, it's part of their responsibility to help take care of him. And for us being there every day, the progression was not as evident. Right. But for someone who only sees him, you know, <clears throat> who only saw him every two or three months, right. it might be more significant. Right. So, um, but they had no issue, you know, helping out with my dad. I mean, they didn't do anything like bathe him or anything like that. But, um, you know, I would get up on Saturday morning and go upstairs and see Dorian had fixed breakfast for him and my dad and they're sitting there with a plate of marshmallows and chicken nuggets okay <laughs> like that's what that's what he wanted that works out you're seven years old good job yay <laughs> so but yeah it was never really an issue and um, honestly there's no way that they would have had the same relationship with their grandfather if they hadn't been there and been so involved because there was one point I remember it, it sounded like there was a herd of elephants on the, the deck of the house and I go running outside and look and I think Julian was probably 11 years old and his little cousin was the same age and I go and I outside and look and they have like I don't know squirt guns or nerf guns or something and my dad is standing on top of the picnic table and I'm like y'all like probably this is not the best idea can you please get my dad off the picnic table he wears he weighs like 230 pounds and he's yeah not a good idea but, you know, just them being able to have that relationship and was so, it was, a, it was a great thing. It really was. And I think the more he deteriorated, the closer in age they got. So it was like having another playmate. It worked out great. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. But it was. I had, um, I did get some flack from other family members who, it's probably the same family members that don't want you to take your kids to funerals. Like, you know what I mean? Like, to upset them. Yeah, yes. circle of life. Suck it up. <laughs> You'll be all right. Yes. Well, if you enjoyed today's video, please like it and uh, forward it to everybody you know and leave positive comments. Thanks.